All right, so two, tune, tune, hang on. Excellent. Hang on. So we're going to have a look. Last week we said that Haggai and um, Zachariah, they're like colleagues. No. So they're talking to the same people at the same time about the same thing. And we remember from last week, what was the key word? Well, the key verse from last week, uh, Zechariah chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. What was the key word? Return to me. Yeah, I'll return to you. And I will return to you. Return to me and I will return to you. In other words, God is not with Judah because they are not with him. Return to me and then I will return to you. And Haggai, Haggai said something a little bit similar. Who remembers what that was? Consider your ways. Consider your ways. So Haggai and Zechariah, again, addressing, addressing the same people at the same time over the same problem. Both prophets are calling God's people, Judah, back to God. So in both instances, Judah and uh, Judah has been released from Babylon. So they've been in captivity for 70 years. This really, so these, these passages here, the, well, these books here, they pick up where Daniel left off in chapter 9. Remember chapter 9, Daniel prayed because he thought that the Messiah was, was coming and he was going to set up his um, um, kingdom on the earth, which also meant he was going to judge which then motivated Daniel to pray for his sin and for the sins of Judah. And in chapter uh, 9, Daniel chapter 9, verse 13, he makes this comment, we've learned nothing. So after 70 years of captivity, we've learned nothing, and now we're going to be released. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to, as I say, judge. Of course, Daniel didn't understand the timing which is really what Daniel 10 through to 12 was all about whereas the angels came and started to try and give him some understanding no, it's not now, it's way off yeah. he, no matter how yeah. many times he was told he still couldn't get it, it was too much for him uh, and then the angel eventually says close the book for as many days from now He's, you know. however so this picks up from that so now you've got the prophets coming in and they're now addressing Judah and there are also, so these, the, with um, Zechariah, so this is really setting the stage for where we're going next in Zechariah. Zechariah gets eight visions, and within those eight visions, uh, they're all apocalyptic. So it's all about uh, the coming tribulation and then the return of Christ, who will judge and set up his millennial kingdom. So what you've got with these two prophets here, one's coming in say, and saying, uh, return to me and I'll return to you. The other is saying, consider your ways. Get right with me. By doing that, by getting right with me, you, you will be with me. You will be with me and I will be with you. So that, that's what these two books are really all about. So why don't we, um, before we go any further, we're going to read the first chapter of Haggai and then we'll give a bit more background on it. And what we're going to do, we're going to go a little bit, so with what we said last week, we'll touch on that again so it's almost like we're going to go a, a step backwards to go three steps um, forward we're going to we're going to not only be addressing uh, the current day but this passage or this this chapter takes us right into the millennial uh, kingdom so you've got this reference and we'll, we, we won't say too much of it just just now but you've got a reference here in relation to uh, the current day for uh, Judah, which is two and a half thousand years ago. And then you go from two and a half thousand years ago to a time ahead of us being the millennial kingdom. But then with that also, you need he, there is a small reference, just a verse or two, with respect to the end of the tribulation. But, so see, these prophets didn't really know what they were saying, did they? I mean, they knew what they were saying, but they didn't understand it. They, no prophet understood that Christ would come into... Parts. That's right. So first and second coming. They only knew about the 
the the end part, which of course is why they got so upset, upset with Jesus when he came. Mm. He didn't know throw the Romans and stuff. So, and uh, didn't set up the middle. Yeah, they're, they're, this is not the Messiah that we want. You know, we've been expecting the Messiah that's going to come and he's going to overthrow the Romans. He's going to establish Israel on the Holy Hill and all that. We're going to rule and reign alongside the Messiah, and all of the nations are going to get smashed. That's what they're looking for. And of course, when Jesus didn't fulfill all that, um, they rejected him. Um, they rejected him. That's right. So, but the next time he comes, he he will do that. Unfortunately for Judah, they're going to be on the um, uh, the sharp end of the stick before Christ returns, and because of their reject the, the rejection of Christ, much of what takes place throughout the tribulation is going to be aimed at them. Anyway, before we uh, go any further, why don't we read the chapter? So we can break it up into two parts. I think would be good. So. Verse 1 through to verse 11, chapter 1, verse 1 to 11. Who wants to read that? Yeah. Okay, and what about, um, what, what about Sharon, you read the next part, so verse 12 to 15. Okay, and who wants to pray? All right. Oh, you want you to somebody else want to pray? Like, maybe right. yeah, pray. Okay, we do get some, um, you know, um, some what do they call it? Um, um, equity and inclusion here. Yeah. <laughs> equity, <laughs> a little bit of <laughs> <That's not bad. laughs> right. So, John, are you gonna you gonna pray? All right. Uh, so, when are you gonna start, Sharon? John. In the second year of Darius the king. In the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shebtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. And the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, the prophet. It is a time for you yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses while this house lies in ruins. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I make, that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins. While each of you busies himself with his own house, Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I, and I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and what the ground brings forth, on man and beast and on all their labours. Then Zerubbabel, <laughs> what do we say? Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. The son of Sheltiel. And Joshua, the son of Josaphat, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent them. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shaltiel, governor of Judah, in the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, in the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Well, thank you, Lord, um, for this gathering today. I pray Lord, that um, you will guide and teach us. Um, uh, through Mark's teaching of uh, uh, Haggai, jumping to, I believe, thank you, Lord, um, for your word, and um, may edify us um, today. 
Amen. So again, as I said previously, you can straight away the language of the, uh, the chapter here and, and flowing on through the rest of the book is you've got that immediate return to me, I'm going to return to you, consider your way. So you've you know you've you've been called back and you've been released by uh, Darius uh, to now rebuild the temple. They've come into the land. So when they came into the land, they were so excited. And we're going to have a look at this uh, in more detail as we go on. And they got busy building straight away. They started with the altar. They built the altar and, and um, obviously then first sacrifice back in the land after 70 years. Uh, so they were able to do that. Then they started with the temple and they, they, um, they got distracted and uh, they got uh, disheartened. And so they stopped doing that. And as we see in the passage here, they started then looking after their own affairs. So instead of looking after God's house, they started looking after their house. So well, God's house laid in ruins, they were living in luxury. And so this is then why the prophet comes in. The prophet says, hey, what, what are you doing? You know, consider your ways. I brought you back out of the land, back to Jerusalem to build a temple. So in the last uh, chapter, so Zechariah chapter 1, verse 1 to 6, it was repent and return. So they had, and it was remember, remember what I've done, what I've done to your forefathers. They said judgment would never come, but it did come. And so then the prophet Zechariah asked the questions. He said, well, where are they now? Are they alive? Uh, did not my word overtake them? What the, um, the literal there is, my word mowed them down. My word hunted them. They thought they would live forever. Well, they did. Did they live forever? No. Are they alive? No, they're not. They're dead. What happened? My word mowed them down. I did what I said I would do. Regardless of how many times a false prophet said it wouldn't happen, it happened. Where are they? They're dead. So now you, the next generation, have an opportunity, a fresh slide, to do what's required. So they've come into the land. They've been distracted. They've been derailed. They're now doing their own thing. They're doing exactly what their forefathers had done. Oh, God doesn't see that. It was God. only the second year, eh? Yeah, well, the first year they built the, the altar. The second year they got busy on the temple, and then there was a year lapse. But they say she started earlier with uh, through Esther. Esther, but it was only a few. Ezra, only a few had gone out to to start building. Now they're all and they're all involved in this, and they're all excited, and they're all giving in some way, you know, financially and also through in their labour. So everybody's involved in this in this project. And, of course, you know, then the enemy comes in. We'll look at this in more detail as we go on. So in, in, in Ezra, uh, the enemy comes in. And so that whilst Judah were very pleased and very excited about what's going on, they weren't too happy at all. And so then they thought, well, you know, they wanted to trick them and they bribed them and they um, they um, threatened them. And so eventually they just they stopped building. And so that's when they went off and started doing their own thing. And this is, of course, as I say, this is where the, the, uh, the prophet then comes in. And, uh, and gives them a stern rebuke. The rebuke here is aimed at the leaders. Uh, it's the leaders, the high priests in particular, who have led um, the people astray. They say here in verse 4, uh, not verse 4, uh, so verse 4 is a question that the prophet asks, uh, well, God asks through the prophet, uh, is it... Is it a time for you to dwell in your panelled houses while well, this house, that's the temple, lies in ruins? And then they answer later on. Uh, where is it? See if somebody can see later eyes on it. It's where um, they say it's not the time to build the um, the temple. Oh, here it is, verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Now, the reason, the reason <laughs> they've been released at this particular time, God's going to plan the purpose, Jeremiah 29, 11. Now that's appropriate. Now you can use that. It's for these people to go in and rebuild the temple. But now they're frustrating God's plans. 
Remember again, Daniel. So Daniel, uh, he was concerned that the Messiah was going to come and he was going to judge because of people have learned nothing. Here's the evidence. I've learned nothing. They're doing exactly what their forefathers had done. They're repeating the same. Uh, God through Zachariah says, if you do the same thing that your forefathers have done, I'm going to treat you in the same way. I mowed them down, I'm going to mow you down as well. They repented, but it was only, you know, it was lip service, it wasn't lasting. Mm. You do the same, you get the same treatment. And we'll see more about uh, through Zechariah as we go. Uh, but the interesting stuff, so what's, this, this is again um, narrowed in on with the words here in verse 2. Is it 2? Yeah, verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the temple. So as I said, so they've been released to build a temple. They've been released to build a temple. But they're saying, and they started the temple, and they were so excited about it. But now they're saying it's not the time to build it. And it was the high priest saying, notice the words here, these people, not my people, these people. In other words, I'm not with them. And they're not with me. Well, I'm not with them because they're not with me. It's more than the point. So these people, but the language changes. When they return to God, you see over in verse uh, 13, then Haggai, the messenger of the prophet, spoke to the people, the Lord's message, I am with you, declares the Lord. So there's a, there's a shift because the people responded. They obeyed the prophet. And it was through fear. So fear was the motivation. And likewise, also through Zechariah, where Zechariah says, if you do what your forefathers do, did, uh, did, I'm going to do to you what I did to them. So there is a, there is some, a healthy dose of fear now uh, running through their veins. We see that uh, in this passage, uh, can't quite lay my eyes on it, but there's a, there's a verse here somewhere that says, you know, they, 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 they feared God and then they, 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 they responded effectively, they changed. So was, fear was a motivation uh, that helped them to, to change their ways. So Haggai, again, um, uh, Zechariah, and all of, you, all of the, the prophets of God, like we said last week, these are true prophets of God. See, these are the ones that uh, correction. When the true prophet of God speaks, it's always a rebuke. And it's, it's, a, it's a sharp rebuke. Now, there is encouragement around here, and we'll see it as we go on. But it's in the context of a rebuke. So the rebuke is you're not doing what I told you to do. The difference between this, uh, these, the, the, the true prophet of God and the, and the, and the phonies, uh, the, the, the ones that Jeremiah was dealing with in particular, that got the forefathers into trouble, but they were the ones who came in and said, peace, peace and prosperity, peace and security. God won't judge us. No, we're the apple of God's eye. We were in covenant with God. Da, 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 da. But God did judge. So the true prophet, an Old Testament prophet, always, always brings a hard word. It's never God's got all of his, you know, this great, amazing plan for your life and whatever, whatever. It's no, you're in, you're in, you're in strife. Return and repent. And because of their actions. Because of their actions, which, which, nice which is what prompted well. the prayer. <laughs> but, the, but the prophet was never, uh, the, the prophet was always prompted by God mm. to address Israel or Judah, so wow. generic Israel, as a result of their sin. So they were constantly in trouble. This is why the prophets kept coming. But the purpose of the prophet is to turn them around, to turn, is to return and to repent. Here, consider your ways. So with, Jer with Zechariah, it's return and repent. Here, it's rebuild. Consider your ways. In other words, Paul said it like this, examine your heart. Examine yourself. Consider your ways. Examine yourself. It's the same language. <laughs> Are you in step with me? No, you're not. Look around. I'm not with you which is why he says these people, and then later on says my people. He picks, picks it up. Um, the language is, again, repeated in chapter um, 2, I think, verse 4 and 5. Yeah, so we've got here. So, again, now, now the, the word of the prophet, well, God, the word of God through the prophet, the words are quite encouraging. But, again, remember, context. Context is it's, there is a rebuke. Yet now be strong. 
uh, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord, be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, and the, the high priest, be strong, all of your people on the land, declares the Lord, work, I am with you, declares the Lord. So what does he say? The, 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 um, uh, the prophet, God through the prophet says, I want you to consider your ways, I want you to rebuild, I want you to get back to work. Get back to work. So consider your ways, return, and, and get back to work. And it goes on in verse uh, 5. According to the covenant that I made with you, when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. So get, we'll get into the fear not in a moment. Now, at the moment, it, to start with, they were. It was, it was a dose of healthy fear, godly fear, that got them back on track, gave them the motivation, steered them back in the right direction. So the fear was good. It was a, a, a reverence of God. But here now there is fear not. Now the fear not is in relation to judgment. We're going to we're going to uh, touch on that in a little while. The uh, any, any any questions on this before we before we go on? Yeah, the the first fourteen and the Lord stirred up the spirit of. Zerubbabel in the um, in the spirit of Joshua. So, what's what's that about? The I was going to stir them up. He, he brings the spirit and stirs them up to the spirit. Yeah. So, say, so, say so exactly what this John, a, John is, exactly what John said. So it's the God. God is just stirring him up. He's motivating him. He's bringing him back to remembrance. This is, this is what I've done before, and this is what I'm going to do again. Okay, so remember. Uh, yeah, yeah. So he, they're remembering. This is what I've done in the past, yeah. and this is what I'm going to do again. The, the words here, interestingly, uh, in, from verse of five, verses um, four to five, hey, ready? That's with respect. So going on, that's with respect to the temple rebuild. <clears throat> and he's, where he says, um, uh, be strong, be encouraged, fear not. They're the exact words that David used when he was building the temple, the first temple. So this is the second temple now that they that are rebuilt. So that's interesting in itself. So there is there is a a, 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 a reminder. What I've done then, I'm going to do again. So exactly what John I said. It's stirring them up. It's yeah. encouraging them. It's reminding them. Yeah. 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 It doesn't not a legal spirit. It doesn't necessarily. I think you you seem to be alluding that it might mean. That they have the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit there. Is that what you mean by that? No, that no like mean? some kind of like angel or spirit that's but it's not. It's just a it's just yeah, thing. it's just trying to get them zealous and trying to get them yeah. encouraged to do the work. Yeah, you know, you right. stir someone up, you know, to try that's and right. sort of yeah, that's right. get yeah. something done, you know. Yeah. yeah. So so with Zachariah again, he reminds the he reminds the current generation of their forefathers. This is what they do. Don't do that. Then mm -hmm. now here with Haggai, he reminds them of their um, predecessors. Now, the good guys, do that. You know, what they did, do that. Don't do that. Do this. Now, when so the, the, what, what he's doing here is he's encouraging them. He's, again, getting them excited about the project. Mm -hmm. So when they came out of um, Babylon, they were so excited about this, this project. And they, it was because the enemy came in. So uh, Ezra chapter four, uh, verse one to five. The enemy came in, and the enemy came in uh, first. They, they weren't happy with the, the, the project at all, and so they wanted to stop it. So they tried to stop it by being sneaky, trick them, and that didn't work. Then they tried to bribe them, and that didn't work. And then they threatened them, and that kind of did work. And so that's where this is now where the, the work stopped. So they were doing good work. They were on track, and they got distracted by the enemy they got derailed by the enemy and then then furthermore they got distracted by the world so they instead of building a temple now they're building their own houses they, and what does god say to them with regards to this he said because you haven't put me first you, you, you're trying to get rich you're trying to fill your pockets but your pockets have got holes in them no matter what you put into your pocket it just falls out and he says why why does that happen because i blew on it. i blew on your labor whatever you did i blew on it and i destroyed it you know when i read that scripture now yeah. I blow it away can have go, can have go but <laughs> exactly so he, <laughs> we're talking about true well, and false like, prophets right? so we're talking about true and false, false <laughs> prophets so when god blows on something 
something happens, right? So in this case, it's destroyed. Now, if we think about where God, you know, blows in John 3, where, as John 3, 15, uh, earlier back 12, where the spirit blows, you know, nobody can see where the wind goes, that's that, mm -hmm. but it's a wind that transforms. It's a wind, the spirit that tr you can't see it happening. You can see that you can see the you evidence, know. you know, where the tree blows, a tr where, where the wind blows a tree, the tree is swaying. We can't see the wind, but we can see the result of the wind, right? Yeah. Well, it's the same. So with John 3, when the spirit blows, we can't see the wind, we can't see the spirit, but we can see the evidence mm -hmm. of the spirit blowing because we change. Yeah. We're born again. You've got to be born again, which is what the whole passage is about. Mm -hmm. So walking in the light as opposed to not walking in the darkness, etc. So, So when God blows, something happens. So in this case, something bad. Uh, in the tribulation, something very bad. Uh, in relation to our lives, we respond to him when the spirit blows, when God blows the spirit, the wind, something good happens. We change, we become more like him, we transform. Again, uh, the true prophet, when the true prophet says, Thus says the Lord, something, something happens. Whatever, whatever the, the prophet is saying, that word is reliable. It's going to work, it's not going to return forward. It's whatever God said he's going to do, he's going to do. Think back again with. Daniel in chapter 9. Daniel said the people have learned nothing, but God remained faithful to the church, regardless of the people learning nothing in that time. God still released them because God said he would. So he remained faithful to the church. Whatever God said he was going to do, he was going to do. The difference between God, of course, and the, and the prophets is the, with the false prophets is where the false prophets say this or that, well, it doesn't happen. And that is a test of prophecy. The test where the true prophet says this is going to happen and happens, then we know that that, 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 that one's a prophet, unless that one man even uh, may say this is going to happen and it can be accompanying signs and wonders to confirm whatever they've said. If they then lead people away, astray from God, then you also know they're a false prophet, even though their word came to pass and they may have operated with signs and wonders. So Deuteronomy 18 and 20 talk about that. So... The reference you just made, Kenneth Copeland, I can name you because it's appropriate here. Uh, Kenneth Copeland. So Kenneth Copeland said in, in uh, March 2020 that he blew, blew on COVID, blew on it, blew it away, and he said it's gone forever and it'll never be back. Uh, it is finished, thus saith the mighty spirit, the mighty spirit. Whenever yeah, I write awesome. that, I always put low... Uh, lowercase m, lowercase s, because I don't believe it's the Holy Spirit, not for one second. Uh, delusional. So at that time, there was 49,000 cases, uh, COVID cases in America, and now, of course, millions. Uh, I've lost count and track of how many people have been affected since multiple millions, tens of millions. Three, uh, three million, roughly. Three million. Died. Mm -hmm. Well, there was 49,000 cases. So again, God, when God blows on something, we, so Kenneth Copeland, he blew on COVID. He said, I stand in the office of a prophet. He blew on COVID and nothing happened. What a joke. That's why when I saw that, I said, no, that's where it gets it. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the other things is when I was pastoring, um, Kenneth always said the force of the Holy Spirit and, and used the word terminology force. Yeah. And then I had to correct that to the congregation that God doesn't force himself upon anyone. Yeah, right. And, um, yeah. Yeah, okay. You can't force yourself. Notice, so this passage, so, so mm -hmm. what, 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 what we're doing here, number one, we're establishing in, in, in the, uh, the book of Haggai, the book of Zechariah, like every other book in relation to the major minor prophets, establishes over and again that these are speaking on behalf of God. So 14 times, for instance, Haggai uses the word uh, Lord Almighty 14 times just to make it clear. These are God's words, the Lord Almighty. So that in itself got the attention, got the attention of the, um, you know, the audience, particularly because he's addressing the leaders, the high priests and the, um, the, the, the uh, leaders of government, etc. the officials. He's addressing them, wants to get their attention. Now, as I said before, so this at this point, they're in trouble because they've forsaken uh, the temple. When when they came out of um, uh, 
Babylon, they were just so excited, so excited uh, with, you know, they had even though, and, and I, I find this remarkable, you know, uh, people confessing Christians, etc., are just so excited about God and everything's going well. You know, God is good, God is good, you know, and uh, you know, the little great things that he's doing for me and he's blessing me and all of this stuff and whatever. But the attitude quickly changes when things aren't going so well. Is God still good? And that's the question you've got to ask. So when they're coming out of Babylon, when they're coming out of Babylon, they, they're saying God is good. He's, he, so in Ezra, when, 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 when they were released, you know, they're, they're praising God. And out of this also comes a couple of Psalms. And we're reading. So the first one is um, Psalms 126. So we can turn to that. This gives you a sense of, you know, how these people were behaving when they when they were released first from Babylon. And then we will see um, we'll see throughout particular throughout um, Zechariah how that quickly changes. So Psalms 126, who wants to read that? It's only a few verses, uh, six verses. Yeah, I can read it. Okay. Before return to Zion, a sign of essence. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who were uh, those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, "The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad." Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Yeah, so again, you know, very excited uh, group of people. Have another look at, uh, a look, a look at another uh, psalm. So Psalm 36, this one's written by David. And this is a, um, this is an interesting one when we make the comparison between who God is uh, good towards and, uh, and also who he judges. So Psalms 36, uh, uh, 12 verses, who wants to read that? Yeah, transgression, transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flatters, flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely and do good. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not reject evil. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast, you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. O continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your righteousness to the upright of heart. Let not the foot of arrogance come, come upon me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the evildoers lie fallen. They are thrust down, unable to rise. You see the, here the, uh, the comparison. So you've got, again, Romans 11.22. Remember the kindness and severity of God, kindness of those who, who, um, who remain and severity of those who fall. So you've got the both sides of God. So you've got, you see, he's, he's, very, he's kind and loving, compassionate, etc. but he's also a just God. This same language is picked up in Lamentation. So Lamentation is, uh, Lamentation chapter three, they reference the same, the same stuff where, you know, God is loving, compassionate, kind, forgiving, and combating a steadfast love. But then within that mix also, there is like, we start, you know, God has judged us, we can't even bear this, this is so intense, you know, we don't even have any hope, we don't even know if God's gonna forgive us. So there's this, 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 in a change of, you know, you say one minute, yeah, they remember God, that is who God is. 
But this is now our experience of God. He is now crushing us because of our sin. And so when you think about it, so this is Judah going into captivity. So uh, that's lamentation. That's the experience. So that's the tribulation. That's their experience. And they, they see that, hey, we are being judged. It's beyond anything we could we could have comprehended. You know, this judgment. It is. They call it tribulation. It's just. They say it's crushing them. The, the water is over their head. They're drowning. They've got no hope. They don't even know if God's going to deliver them. They're in um, captivity. They've learned nothing. David, uh, Daniel said they've learned nothing. Now they're released, and now they're excited. Look how flippant these people are. How flimsy they are. They get so they're excited and they're saying, Hey, God, you know, we, we're back here. How good are you, God? You're so good. You're so good. So, in Ezra, uh, Ezra uh, deals with the same, um, this the same um, period of time. And, so, and in Ezra, they say, God is good. And so, we see in the passage in, in, in the hundred, is, is, the, is this generation that went, is this the same generation that went into some of them were some, some of them were some the, of them not were. many, not many, no. most of them perished. In fact, there's only 43,000 returned to Jerusalem from Babylon. Now, some stayed in Babylon. They wanted to. But think about this. When Babylon was, when Babylon invaded uh, Judah, Jerusalem specifically, they were no longer a nation. So it gives you an idea. So we don't know how many people died, but it gives you an idea. They were no longer a nation. It wiped them out. So a lot of people perished. So they were either taken into captivity, you're no longer a Jew, you're, you're now being, you, you're, you're part of the Babylonian system now. So you don't have your own, um, you know, uh, nation anymore. You haven't got a nation. You, you be, you're part of us. You do what we tell you to do, etc. cetera. Uh, so only 43,000, 43,000 returned to uh, to. Uh, Jerusalem. There was, I think, seven thousand uh, servants or so. So when they were in um, in Babylon, Jeremiah the prophet said to them, Jeremiah chapter twenty nine said to them, "Build houses, take wives, and repopulate. You've been smashed. There's really nothing left of you. So only a remnant, just a remnant, Sharon, just a, just a, a small one. Only a remnant." Re Turn to um, to uh, Jerusalem. However, remember they were repopulating over that seventy year period of time. They were to build houses, they were to take wives, and they were to pray for the welfare of the city. That's Babylon. In other words, they were to be good citizens. They would contribute to be a part of that that system. When they were released, forty three thousand. That's it. Uh, so they took, I think, uh, as I say, yeah, seven thousand. I think it was seven thousand servants and two hundred um, um, singers as well and so again you know they've come in and they're having a great um, um, celebration a, a sing song etc and god is good god is good if we think back to um um marion marion moses's sister so when they when the israelites were on one side of the red sea you've got the egyptians coming through you know they panic and they complained and they carried on oh yeah, this is terrible god's left us out here he's forsaken us he's going to kill us god is bad god is bad and then of course uh moses prays and god says to moses hold out your, your staff and the red sea opens up and they cross through what does in marion do on the other she side sings she sings a song of praise oh how good are you god oh you're fantastic it's the same stuff we see it over and over again god is good when things are going well god is not so good when things are going bad what these people have done though they haven't got back to their bad you know to, to, to uh, another um time of difficulty that's coming uh, but here, they've just forgotten God, which is why now the, the prophet comes in and he says, uh, get busy. Now, what they did when, when they were starting to build the temple, this is interesting in itself, everybody was involved, everybody was contributing. They were all bringing their um, their financial um, you know, support and aid to be able to, to the point, in fact, the same thing happened with the first temple with Solomon. And so much wealth came and the same thing happened with the tabernacle with moses so much came that he actually had to say stop we've got enough we don't need any more gold we don't need more silver we don't need more anything else 
and the same thing happens on each occasion, which is which is quite you know, it's, it's amazing in itself, isn't it? Mm -hmm. With the false prophets, this is this is this is interesting. So, well, we, before we go there, we'll just cut, we'll go back to these guys. So, these guys now they've got everything together, ready for the rebuild. They've got the striker, they've got the rail, they're um, chasing after the things of the world. But at least these guys here, they're not they're not dipping into God's provision. You know, so the, what was given, what was purpose for the temple, they're not helping themselves to raise things. Now, that's that's happened elsewhere, but but not on this occasion. They're not helping themselves to, to uh, what belongs to God, which was interesting. I heard a um, just just this week a story of a, a guy, well-known um, ministry brand, where some pastors were helping themselves to church offerings. Uh, they were staying in hotel rooms uh, in excess of $1,000 a night and having meals in the region of $800. I don't even know how you spend $800 on a meal, but uh, but regardless, it's made the news. And uh, the difference between a guy like that and, and these guys here is these guys, they're working with their own hands. They're working with their own hands to, to you know, serve themselves. They're forgetting God and now they're, you know, they're serving themselves, etc. But God has said, I don't want you to do that. God said, if you come back to me, I will then come, repent, return and repent, consider your ways. If you come back to me, I will come back to you. And then if you then start rebuilding my temple, which is, again, it's the, it's the outworking. So they've come back to God and now there's the outworking of the obedience, there's a call to obedience, the outworking of the obedience, do what I've called you to do. Then, then he said, I will prosper you. Then he said, I will prosper you. But the prosperity, yeah, the prosperity is namely what in the, in the passage? What is it? No, no, the, the, the fruit of prosperity. It's uh, the, the, or the prosperity, the, the fruit of obedience being prosperity. What is, what, what is the prosperity here? Number one. Love is love. God. It's God, right? Remember uh, Church of Smyrna, if God said you are poor, you say you're poor, but you are rich, why? Because you have me. Remember Church of Lacedaemon, you say you're rich and have no need for anything, but you don't have me, therefore you're poor. So the prosperity, number one, is having God. That's God right. is in their midst. Yeah. Paul says it this way, you are rich. You have no need for anything. Why? Because you have God. Yeah. So the prosperity has got at the moment they don't have God, remember so they would be what they would be in poverty right spiritual poverty so the spiritual poverty because they don't have god now and they're caught up in the things of the world they've been distracted by the things of the world they're trying to build their own houses and fill their own pockets god says your pockets have holes in them no matter how much money i put in them they could fall on keep falling out at the other end because i i will blow on everything you do i will make sure you are not prosperous in anything you do until you come back to me and until you do what I've called you to do, plan and purpose. So stop frustrating my plans, do what I've told you to do, and then I will make you prosperous. Of course, they became prosperous as well in, in a materialistic sense. So there is that prosperity, you know, is basically cursing you, your everyday life. He is, man. That's yeah. what it is. He is. Which is, you know. which is, which is um, where would we ground that elsewhere? Elsewhere, uh, I'll curse you when you go in, and I'll curse you when you go out. Who is that? Uh, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28. 28. Well I was going to say 28. And 30. That's right. It's exactly yeah. what it is. So, whole chapter, Deuteronomy 28, on blessings and cursings. So, yeah. if you do this, you'll get that. If you do that, you'll get that. But Deuteronomy... Um, what about 20... Christians that do do good, and yet they're cursed? Well, they're not. Oh, they're, they're, they, they might be going through some difficulty, to, but Smyrna was going through a lot of difficulty. They're going through tribulation, but they were they were deeply blessed. So they? then, yeah. how do you know when you're going through yes. tribulation and hardship, and when you've been cursed? Because you have God. Mm -hmm. It's the difference, the absence of God, or, or having God. You can have God go through whatever difficulty, as all of the um, disciples did, but they were completely content and at peace, and so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's having God. What are we going to say? Colin? I was going to say mainly the difference is whether you're, uh, whether you've sinned or you have sin in your life, whether you're being punished because of evil you've done or you're being punished, not necessarily punished, but uh, suffering or persecuting because of 
things coming to you because you're a Christian. Like, it's like discipline, or yeah, discipline. Or, he disciplines it's, the it's, one he wants. Yeah. We There's know two he kinds of stuff. He loves, and we know he's the potter to smash the clay when he wants and rebuild the clay when he wants. And we know Christians go through trials and tribulations, and we know humans can be cursed by evil people. Yeah. But how do you tell the difference between all that? You can tell when God's coming after you. <laughs> it's like God's. It's like God sort of hiding His face from you, or or His um. What's the other way of saying it? Behind, or setting his face, on, or setting his face against yeah, you. Yeah, that's right. He'll, he'll curse you when you go in. Curse you go when you go out. You'll, you'll, when it's morning, you wish it was um uh, the afternoon, and when it's afternoon, you you wish it was the morning. Basically, you want your life to speed up, yeah. speed itself up. Yeah. It's basically a, it's it's a sort of different uh like not lifestyle like like you'll be rebuked for. It's two kinds. It's either general um, persecution from the as you, because you're a Christian, or it's because you've done something wrong. You'll know. You'll know. You'll, you'll know, know the difference. Hebrews twelve talks about it. You know, not to chastise. No, not to. Um, um, what is it? Not to disregard the chastising of God or something like that. Or so, what, yeah, I can't remember the um, exact wording. But anyway, it's it's where, where God chastises his um his, his people. There's a um you know there's there's a knowledge, hey, God has done this to me, or God is doing this to me. Uh and there is a reason, you'll know what the reason is. And it's God like is bringing Peter, correction. I was gonna say it was like Peter when Peter he says, um just forgot. It's like it's better to be, you know, to be rebuked. To suffer for something you haven't, that you don't like, for something that you don't deserve, than for something you actually do deserve. Yeah, so something right. to that effect. Yeah, uh, right. I, think, yeah. I think Peter yeah. says it. So um, with with these guys here, so they they're being chastised, they're being rebuked, mm. and they know why. So the prophet comes in and he addresses them, and he's head on. He says, "Hey, you guys, uh, you you need to consider your ways. This is what you're doing." And remember, he comes in with the Lord Almighty. So it's ju just so you know, this is not me talking. This is God talking. The Lord Almighty is talking to you about what you're doing, and you better sort this out. And if you don't, as in Zachariah's words, uh, what did your forefathers I'm going to do to you? Remember these two guys? It's like it'd be like me and Wendy sitting here together, talking to you. And then I'm saying something, and then she's saying something. I'm... You know, I'm, I'm Zachariah and she's Haggai. And, and we're saying the same thing, the same people at the same time. Uh, we're using some different languages, etc. They have some um, different insights on um, what's to happen uh, in the future, etc. But again, it's the same message through two different prophets uh, addressing the people of God for, you know, for, for the same reason. They have strayed. They've gotten off track. Look here, though, what happens. We see in verse 12, I, I mentioned before, uh, where they obey. So they obey when they heard. So it was a remnant. Uh, so we see here that, the, um, that a remnant of the people obeyed. Why a remnant here? Well, there's only a remnant. That, that, so all of the people essentially obey, but there's only a remnant. And, but the, the word there can be used, of course, interchangeably because when, when the word does come, oh, they, didn't, they didn't remain. The bulk of them don't remain. Uh, we'll see this as we move, move further on down uh, within uh, Zechariah. But a remnant, I, uh, you might have a, a, a good number respond, but few. We know this from so many other passages. Uh, we think about the, the parable of the soul. There's only uh, one fruitful um example of four so multitudes can respond to the message because it comes in quite powerfully but yet few of them they, they forget it they have they have uh we were just talking about this with our friend who who said he would never ask for a, another um seed offering of a thousand dollars a month later he was asking for a seed offering of a thousand dollars now of course if you give him a seed offering of a thousand dollars a love offering you can uh, avoid COVID and even more recently if you give him a seed offering of a thousand dollars World War three won't start uh, so so again you know they have short memory said I'll never do it again and has mm -hmm. not stopped doing it um, he said that two years ago I won't do it again and he's continued to do it ever since I think too um, Deb like 
I've been chastised before <laughs> and like going to a hard time. Blah, blah. And I think at the end of it, you know, you've chastised because you know what you've done wrong. Like, well, it's kind yeah, of the same to either through a preach or through the word or through yeah. remembrance of scripture. Yeah. You know, all the like, yeah. Like, I remember just for six months getting the same scripture over and over again. Yeah. It was about um, loving the world, more than you love them, you're not worthy of him, kind of thing. Another time was to a preacher, it was about all about pride versus humility, and I knew he was speaking to that. Mm. But there was difficulty and it was struggle, and it was, yeah, it's you'll, you'll know it's, it's quite well, it's John A. said, <laughs> no, it's, it's quite, it can be a painful experience. And this is what uh, these guys would have felt something of this. We see again here that in verse 12, that when the remnant they heard the words of the uh, the prophet. They obeyed, and we see further on down uh, that the people feared the Lord. You know, they said so they they knew God sent the prophet. We see that um, Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. So their fear of God through the words of the prophet resulted in obedience. So that's important to know. You you see a lot today. The headlines are full are full of uh, to no end of stories of churches that have gone astray leaders have gone astray and it's one in particular that just seems to you know there's it's endless amounts of material on this one that they continually keep falling over and over and, and literally it's almost every week you can hill song i'll say almost every week there is something about someone in hill song falling failing the one that was that the thousand dollar rooms and eight hundred dollar meals that was a hill song one as well so Brian Houston now stepping down, resigning because of his misconduct Carl towards Lance. women. Carl Lenz. It's just on and on. It goes on and on. And it's like the gift that keeps on giving if you're looking to, to you know, slander the church. I mean, it just there's so much material that's not funny. Mm. The problem with that church and so many others like it is they never preach on sin. There's no fear of God. So, and this is what happens. When there's a lack of fear, when there's a lack of fear, in the church, the church was straight. This is what happened. Now Jeremiah's, I, I mean, Haggai's coming in and he's, well, God's coming back in through Haggai and he's injecting some healthy, a good healthy dose of fear. And he says it through Zechariah too. Remember your forefathers. If you do what they did, I'm going to do to you what I did to them. Remember, they said it wouldn't happen, and it happened. And I don't need to say too much more about it because you were there. You saw it. You, they're the kids. They're the direct descendants of those people that went into Babylon. They're the ones now coming out. Some of them would have gone into Babylon. Some of them they would have been pretty old, but they would have gone in as babies, and they'd be just coming out of the end. So they would be, you know, they'd be well in the years by now. Uh, but they didn't need to say too much about it. More than that, Zechariah, because of course they. You know, they remembered it. So they remembered how difficult it was. And now, of course, now they're released, etc. They've quickly forgotten, you know, hey, this is what God did to me then. He will do it again. But well, then, then, in a way, that's 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 partly the was not all, but some responsibility to the people that were taken into captivity not to pass it down and how to bring themselves to mm -hmm. their offspring. That's right. So, but like they learned nothing. But they learned out. nothing. So Daniel said... Um, but they were Daniel hitting their Lyons. children. I mean, it was so bad. Yeah, that was in... Um, uh, when they were being um, um, siege. Yeah, under, they were under siege. Was, that yeah, was, yeah, that's yeah. right. So, yeah, yeah they, they, were, they were starving. Yeah, they did shop and stuff. Uh, but but the, uh, the the, the um, worst than that is where they were sacrificing their children to Moloch and Baal. Mm. Uh, but that was so, before the judgment. No, that was... We, it was before the judgment. But, but so was the cannibalism as well before oh, they had to be in exile. Yeah. No, that, that was, was when they were under siege. Yeah. That's when they were under siege and they had no food. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was a, it was judgment, but they weren't they hadn't been exiled. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so there's a lot in this passage. We we're not going to have a um a huge amount of time to to go into it too deeply. Uh but so what happens here is obviously the people they they're now uh, encouraged and motivated again. Uh, they're told to be strong and, and to, to get building. So they do that. 
so we come down to uh, verse three. So remember with Zechariah, Zechariah asked three questions. And he said to the to Judah, he said, um, um, are your father's forefathers alive? Uh, are your father, forefathers live forever? You know, where are they now? Yeah, well, they're dead. Uh, did not my word mow them down? Uh, yeah, it did. And, and that, those words come directly out of um, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28, verse 15 and 45, I think, where it says, if you if you do good this, if you do good, then I will bless you. If you do bad, if you do bad, then I will curse you. I will chase you down. I will hunt you down and I will kill you. So those <laughs> words in Zechariah are exactly what was said through Moses in Deuteronomy. I will hunt you down. My words will hunt you down. They will mow you down. They will kill you. So this is what Zechariah, you asked those three questions in the last being where did not my words overtake him. Now, so again, remembering, remembering what happened to the forefathers. So Haggai does something similar. So they're building this temple and now, you know, they're, 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 they're using rubble. So they haven't got the, you know, everything refined as they did with the first temple. They, they, they're picking up the rubble that was destroyed through uh, the Babylonian invasion. So Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple. They're now rebuilding the temple with rubble. And so it doesn't look as good. And, and, and so they get a little bit, um, they get a little bit disheartened with that. And this is where these words come in, in verse uh, three. Who is left among you who saw the house in its former glory? So they're talking about the temple. So again, some of the ones who went into captivity are there. Because he's like, how many are here that saw it the first time? So there'll be a few, not many, and they'll be old. So, the, you know, the, the youngest would be 70 years old, right? So because they were in captivity, so if he went into one year, and he wouldn't really remember it from back then. So, you know, give it, give or take, it might be 10 or 10. Yeah, yeah, he might be a little bit older. So then there's, there's another question following on from there. Uh, how do you see it now? So, you know, what did the what did the first temple look like, John? O? Did, did you see it? Yeah, yeah, it was beautiful. How does this compare to that? This is rubbish. <laughs> that was that was built with everything refined. Now we're, we're building with rubble. And then there's a third question here: uh, Is it not nothing in your eyes? In other words, it's just rubbish. It's, this is and and. Uh, the, the same is said of Zechariah when Zechariah talks about the rebuilding of the temple as well. And so there's some words, there's some verses there that I've been taken out of context in relation to, uh, you know, not, my, but not, by my, not by power, not by power, but my, my spirit, says the Lord, etc. That's to do with the temple, that, that God will remove every, every obstacle to rebuild the temple. Now, the obstacle here, of course, has been, uh, the enemy so the enemy have stopped them derailed them and distracted them from building a temple now the prophet's getting them back on track but now they're discouraged they're saying well this is rubbish this is not even they're, they're crying actually they're, they're weeping at the temple saying well this is this is nothing close to, to the beauty the glory the splendor of, of, of the previous temple which is why then the words come following uh, yet now be strong as a rubble declares the lord be strong O joshua of Zedekiah, the high priest, be strong, all of you people in the land, declares the Lord. So be strong three times. Be strong, be strong, be strong. Now work. Now work. Get to it. Don't worry about what it looks like now. Don't worry about that. Just get on with it. And then following the, follow, the words following that, for I am with you, declares the Lord, according to the covenant that I made, with you when I came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. So, in other words, I'm going, I'm doing a good work. I'm doing a good work. So, again, in other words, it's quite out of context all the time. You know, I'm doing a good work in your in, in your in your midst, you know. And then of course we use it for here and now in relation to whatever we think God is doing for us today and building building our churches and all that kind of stuff which is totally out of context it's to do with the building of the temple so this is all about the building of the temple so the second temple but look at this this is where it gets really interesting verse six thus says the lord of Christ, yet once more in a little while i'm going to shake the heavens and the and the earth and the sea and the dry land so i thought of you sharon when i saw this just in just a little while in just a little while, I'm going to shake everything. 
I'm going to shake the, the heavens, I'm going to shake the land, I'm going to shake the sea. I'm, in just a little while, Sharon, yeah. that was two and a half thousand years ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, soon, I hate soon, I want a day, I want a day. Two and a half thousand years ago, just a little while. Now, in comparison to what eternity, in comparison to the, the age of the earth, two and a half thousand years is just a little while in, in God's. In God's eyes, That's it's right. just a little it like while. Us. It is just a little while. But what's this talking about? In just a little while, I'm going to shake everything. Everything that can be shaken, I'm going to shake it. all silver and gold is his. Mm. So what's, it, what's it talking about? What's it talking about? So we're talking about the temple. What's this? New heavens, new earth. How does that go from this temple... The building of this temple, the second temple, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's rubble. It's not great. It's not grand. Nowhere near as good as the first one. And just a little while, I'm going to shake everything anyway. Don't worry about it. What's he saying? So the tribulation. He says, period, don't put your faith in things of the world. What were they doing? Putting their faith in things of the world. And had neglected God's house. That's right. So God, now they're building God's house and they're upset because, hey, it's not that grand after all. Don't worry about it. I'm going to shake everything anyway. What did Jesus say when he walked past the temple and they thought, oh, this is so good. It looks so grand. What did he say? Yeah, not, not one stone. Not one remain. stone will be left. Yeah, Didn't worry. they refurbish yeah. it from then, no? Yeah, they, no, not after, not at, well, 70 AD Jesus was referring to. Yes, what they did, so then, um, um, Howard, yeah, he built on it. And he, he made it magnificent. So they call it Solomon's Temple. It was a magnificent. Yeah. They call it like it was the eighth wonder of the world. It was a yeah. you know, magnificent structure. But that's, of course, what the disciples were looking upon. And they'd say, oh, this is beautiful. And Jesus said, yeah, it's nothing. Yeah, not, 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 not a stone that's going to remain. And this whole thing's coming down. 70 AD, right? They've got destroyed again. Why? Because they did exactly the same thing. It's what they did, what, what they did in Jeremiah. It's another 70, 70 What's that? weeks. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's exactly right. So here, look <laughs> at this. Numbers. This is really yeah. So what God's saying here, don't worry about, you know, how good it looks. It's not about that. It's, it's like, you know, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Some of us look better than others. I mean, I'm pretty good. <laughs> God, God is not worried about the exterior. He's, he's concerned about what's in the heart, right? And so this is what he's doing with his people here. He's saying, don't worry about the outside. The outside. I want your heart. I want you to be consider your ways that I can return to you. You've got to return to me that I can return to you. I'm not with you now. These people, they keep doing this stuff. And then later the language changes. My people, my people. So reading on, we see in, so of course the, the shaking of everything. That's when Jesus comes back. So Matthew 24, uh, chapter 24, verse 29, Jesus comes back after the tribulation. Everything's shaken. It's a judgment, right? But there is a shaking through the tribulation as well. There's a shaking through the tribulation. So it says here in verse 7, I'm going to shake the nation. So, of course, that's when Jesus returns. And all of the treasures of the nation shall come in, and I will fill us this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. So I will fill this house with glory. And then it goes on, another verse misquoted all of the time. Verse 9, the latter glory of the house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. A lot of glory. So a lot of people use it today in relation to supposed revival happening in the church and all of that kind of gibberish. It has got nothing to do with that. You, Tribulations coming before revival, or you know, revival will come in the tribulation, but before the house, the glory that God is talking about here is the Shekinah glory of God, where God is in the house. God is in the house. And so the, the glory of God is what fills the house. It's not the gold, it's not anything else. In it's not the you know, kingdom. in the millennial kingdom. So it's not great sound systems and smoke and lights and you know, whatever, all of that kind of stuff. It's it's God in the house. So again. <laughs> Yeah. So again here, yeah, again here, return to me that I can return to you. So return to me, build my house. I want your heart, be right with me. I'm going to return to you. When does Christ return in the way that he's talking about here in the millennium? So what happens here? He goes from the building, this, the, the temple that's being built two and a half thousand years ago 
to I'm going to shake everything at the end of the tribulation and then I'm going to establish the next temple, the millennial temple, which I'm going to fill with me. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing is about his people being back with God and God being back with his people. But that can only come through fear and obedience. Obedience resulting from fear and then getting on with what God's called them to do. So the outworking of that. So it's the faith outworking. So faith not saved by works, but because we're saved, we do good works, right? We're back, we're back in line with the plan and the purpose of God. So they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. That's what God is trying to do here. So there is another temple in between this temple, the millennial temple, and the one that's being referenced, so the second temple that was destroyed in 70 AD, which was which temple? The third temple. So where does that come into play? When does that get built? Uh, so three and a half years. No, it was Jesus. When, when, when Jesus does the third Christ temple get built? The tribulation. Jesus in the tribulation. Oh. So the shaking here, so he overlooks it. He, he just jumps straight over the top of it. Soon. Yeah, it's soon. very soon. <laughs> so so he jumps straight over. Now, remember the language uh, in Zechariah chapter 1 verse 2 God was very angry not a little bit angry not just a slightly ruffled he was furious and then later on in Zechariah also we see that God's anger was hot and who was it hot against the shepherds the leaders who had led Israel astray who had distracted them once again got them off off track God was angry so the tribulation is the wrath of the lamb right it's the wrath of God so God is angry. That's what, so the tribulation, that's what, um, that's what it looks like for God to be angry. So we see the same thing within um, uh, Lamentations when God was angry. They were being crushed and they were being, they were drowning. They, they came to the place where the, the, they didn't know there was any hope. Remember, they, they go in, they, God is great when everything is great. He, no, God's not so great when everything's not so great. And, and, and you're going to see the same thing in the tribulation as well. So there's a change of perspective. So here, the, the prophet here, he jumps straight over the tribulation. Well, comes in at the end of the tribulation, seven years, the shaking of everything, and then comes straight into that um, that final, uh, that was well, the seventh day, so the, the millennial um, kingdom, the millennial dispensation, uh, and talks about this last temple, the last temple. After that, after the, the, the 7,000 years of the kingdom, there is no temple after that. So Revelation talks about that in uh, chapter 22. I think it is, uh, where there is no temple, there's no need for any temple because God, God is there. Even though Christ is there in the millennium, there is, still a, there is still a temple, no temple after that. So interesting, isn't it? We see here in these last verses that... Um, uh, yeah, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. So with the glory of God, when the glory of God is in the temple of God in the millennium, there's going to be peace. So it's a time of peace. The Prince of Peace is ruling with a rod of iron. That's why there's peace, because Jesus is ruling with a rod of iron. Revelation picks up on it a couple of times in relation to Jesus ruling with a rod of iron in the millennial kingdom. He keeps sin at bay. The, the, the devil's in the in the pit for a thousand years. Jesus is ruling and reigning with an iron rod. Sins at bay. That's why there's peace. Uh, Jesus is in the in the um, in the temple. The place is filled with the glory of God. That's why there's peace. God is very present. Uh, now there is um, uh, the glory of God is 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 uh, throughout the whole of the world. The scripture says everything that is is only because God. Because God breathes on it. So God blew on it. So God sustains everything Where's through his breath. Everything that is, is, is God. Genesis, creation story. Genesis, so, yes. so whatever God said, yeah. whatever God breathed on, yeah. is. It only is because God's breathing on it. So God blew up. You can say God blew on So, yeah. but so so the glory of God is through everything, is 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 throughout the whole of the world because without without the glory of God, nothing would be. Nothing would survive, nothing would live. But in the millennium, the knowledge of God is throughout the whole of the world. So at the moment, not everybody knows about God. But then 
everyone will know God. There'll be no, no, no atheist. There will be peace. There will be order. Uh, if you go against God in that time, then it would be there would be um, quick judgment. Uh, the scripture says in Isaiah that uh, if somebody lives lives less than 100 years and there's something, or something dies at 100 years and there's something tragic, something's tragically gone wrong. In other words, you've gone in the sin. Uh, you've crossed the line and, and God's judged you quick. So that's what it's going to be looked like. What's, what it's going to look like. So here, Haggai, amazing um, chapter. He's talking about the people of God getting back in line and, and back um, uh, aligned with God, doing what God has called them to do, not being worried about uh, the, the temple when it's being uh, built because God says, you know, don't worry about it too much. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, get another one anyway. It's going to be much better than this one, and I'm going to fill it, and it's going to be amazing. Also, this verse here is worth noting uh, just before that. Verse 8, um, Debbie, you picked up on it. Um, He's going to fill the house with glory, says the Lord. He says, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. So here, uh, God is going to shake the nations and he's going to take back everything that's his, which is absolutely everything. <laughs> he's going to take it off the nations and he's going to redistribute it as he sees fit for his, for, for his purpose. Remember, with the building of the, um, the temple here the, in Ezra, uh, Everybody was asked to contribute something so, um, to gold, silver, whatever. They had so much, they had to say, we've got enough. We've got more than enough. The same thing happened with Solomon's temple. The same thing happened with Moses' tabernacle. The difference here is on this occasion with this temple, this is the next authorised temple, that the, the tribulation temple will be destroyed. For the tri tribulation temple, we've said it before, that everything is ready to go without one. Uh, they're saying it takes about two years to build. They can't build it because it needs to go where the Dome of the Rock is. That's a fault line, uh, uh, on a fault line. Uh, so some would say there's going to be an earthquake and a tribulation that's going to destroy the Dome of the Rock and then that'll give uh, 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 the land available, make the land available to rebuild the next temple. When Jesus Christ returns, there's another earthquake, right? So in fact, there's earthquakes um, starting the tribulation and there's earthquakes in the tribulation and there's another great earthquake at the end of the tribulation. Uh, when the two saints are raptured, the two witnesses are raptured, there's a great earthquake. And, and when you hear the words come up here, the rapture. So with the church, chapter 4, verse 1, it stands to reason when they disappear, there'll also be an earthquake which will start the tribulation. Remember when Jesus was resurrected, um, when, when he died, when he was resurrected, there was an earthquake and the graves broke open and people were seen wandering. Well, when the church goes up, the graves are going to break open. Then Christ they rise first, etc. So there's going to be an earthquake then. That'll be the start of the tribulation. So that earthquake. Now, these there are earthquakes that are specific to Israel. Others that are, um, occur um, globally throughout the tribulation, in particular. So this, the earthquake specific to Israel, I would argue that that'll take out the Dome of the Rock. That'll then give an allowance for to be able to build the, the, the new temple. When Jesus Christ returns, there's another earthquake. It'll destroy this temple again because that's it, it destroys everything defiled. This is this the, so the, the tribulation temple is a defiled. It's an abomination. So it'll probably only be existing for about four years. Yeah, that's right. No long. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. So it, it made they're saying it takes two years to build, it has to be built by the halfway. Point for the Antichrist to be able to pronounce. And have a little claim. bit of normalcy, but, you know, some yeah. sacrifice. Yeah, so it won't. Good yeah, yeah, that's right. So it won't last. <laughs> it won't last long at all. And so Jesus then destroys that temple. Mm -hmm. So it's not even considered an authorised temple. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, he, he, he brings in this fourth temple. Now, this is really interesting. So next week, we're going to go back into Zechariah. So Zechariah, the, the, so this, um, the second part of chapter one, talks about the apocalyptic horseman. Think about this. So he, he leaves off here with the temple. He jumps over the tribulation temple, straight over to the over to the millennial temple. But he's got that shaking. Throughout the whole of the tribulation, it's going to be a shaking, right? And, of course, it starts with a shaking and earthquake. That's what the shaking is, an earthquake. And it ends with a, with, with a shaking and earthquake, and there are earthquakes all the way in between. So when a tribulation starts, it starts with an earthquake, and then also the seals are, are, are released. The first of the seal is the white horse, a white horse who is the antichrist, goes around deceiving, conquering, etc. followed by three other horses, and collectively they kill a, a quarter of mankind. Zechariah 
picks up on that in the next section uh, that we'll be looking at, which is in the uh, second part of chapter one. So here, the temple, it focuses on the temple. So we've got one temple going to what, to another temple. Still got the tribulation period. Now the tribulation period, Zachariah brings it. So you can see one problem. So it's like Wendy and I telling a story. I say this part, and then Wendy jumps in and, and, and gives a little bit more. And then I come in and I'm saying, and I just continue the story, and I give a little bit more. But then Wendy comes back in, and then she says something. But it's the same story, and it's a complete picture. And this is what we're going to see through this um, these two books combined. We're going to we spend a lot of time in, in Haggai as, as we go through Zechariah. But you can see. So Haggai the, is talking about this current temple they're building, and Zechariah is talking about the. No, see no. Zechariah. So he starts by talking to the, about the current temple and then he bounces over to the Millennium Temple. He misses that. What verse? Is that just because he didn't know? No, no. Where he talks of where he, where he says, um, uh, yeah, verse, uh, verse 6, where he says, uh, he wants more, I'm going to shake the heavens, et cetera, et cetera. He's going to shake the nations. And he's going to all of the treasures and the gold, etc. From the, that they're going to, um, he's going to take, and then he's he's going to his house will be full of greater glory. Uh, again, um, in verse nine, the latter glory of the house is greater one, sorry, than one. the former. Hang on, hang on. No, Zach, Zach, right? No, hang on. Oh, We're hang in hang on. on. Oh, hang on. Hang on. I don't know. Yeah, but you meant hang on. I just check this if you're listening. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so so he's talking about the ladder, he's talking about the ladder temple here. So he jumps straight over the top of it. But then what happens is uh Zachariah fills the gaps. So then Zachariah, where we where, where we will pick up next week with Zachariah, he comes in and he gives us more information what happens in between. Zachariah has eight visions. And they're all apocalyptic. They're all talking about the tribulation. And then he concludes with the return of Christ from chapters 10 on uh, to 14. And then 14 looks at the millennium. So these two books are actually really incredible. Think about this. Two and a half years ago, these prophets calling the people of God back to where they need to be with God, that God can position them accordingly for his redemptive plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. This is what it's all about. And the whole thing points at Christ, but yet they couldn't see that, you know, two parts, et cetera, as we do. They just point to the latter part where Christ returns and rules and reigns, et cetera, et cetera. But the prophets, what the prophets are doing here is they're positioning the people of God for, the, for, for, for well, for us it would be for the return of God, but they're positioning the people of God for their Messiah, which is what Daniel was so concerned about. Well, we end there because there's so much more in this passage. Um, we can talk about tonight, but we just have time. But you can see these are really weighty books. There's this, this, they're loaded with information. We'll be doing this for the rest of the year, uh, for Zachariah in mm -hmm. particular, but we'll be you know, coming in and out of this. But what, what this will do, uh, you'll find we'll be spending a lot of time in the book of Revelation because what Zachariah is talking about and Haggai also, it's the book of Revelation. And, but they're just they're just giving uh, a, a different take. Um, you know, they're giving some information that's not 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 found through. Uh, the, you know, people think, oh well, it's Daniel and Revelation and the, the two to go together. No, but you find passages and portions like the the, the um, minor prophets in particular. It's really that what they're talking about is is all double referencing. So it's it's to the people of God there and then. But it's also the people of God in the tribulation. So remember, the tribulation is aimed at the Jews first and foremost. It's to get them back on track. But the whole of the world will come into. Um, Do they address much of AD seventy or the most things during the tribulation period? Uh, well, that, the only reference really that I can think of um, to um, what happened in 70 AD is where Jesus said to uh, the Jews then that he said, uh, and he wept. He said, you know, if only, if only you received me, you know, you could have avoided that. But you now that's this is what's going to happen. And so when he was talking about the destruction of the temple then, that's what he was referring to. Mm -hmm. So there's not a whole lot on that because it's not a major deal. I mean, the, the, the big deal is Jesus returning. And so this is the whole point. Jesus is returning. Except they got scattered there, didn't they? Yeah, they got scattered as they did every other time. I mean, they're going to get scattered again in the tribulation. Yeah, but for 1800 years, they got scattered. Yeah, yeah. Long time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah.
a child. Because for because they were disobedient, right? Mm. And that's the whole the that's whole the point of the, the whole point of a tribulation, the whole point of any trouble, the whole any any of the judgment is to bring them but back. Wasn't so much more about I mean, it was about them, but not as much about them as the church. And hey, after seven, well, not after seven AD, but after the coming of Christ. Yeah. So you know, we never exiled them for more than for, that's the longest exile. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Scattering. Yeah, mm. that's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, they, they, again, tempor <laughs> temporarily cut off, weren't they? Temporarily cut off. Temporarily cut off. So Romans uh, 9 through 11, temporarily so cut off. Of but then even then, you know, God is continually calling, still calling them. Even through that time, God is still calling them. Yeah. And we'll be, in, again, the tribulation. That's what the whole, that's the whole point. As Haggai is saying, consider your ways, as Zechariah is saying, uh, repent and return, that message is continual. All the way through into the tribulation, etc. Mm -hmm. That's the message. That's what God is saying. Through all of this is repent, return, consider your ways, rebuild. <laughs> yes, that's what we can see. Okay, why well, don't we um are we gonna have communion? Sharon? Yeah. Thanks, The book of Revelations talks about chapter 21. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lord are the temple. That's right. And I think that's a beautiful scripture that sums up temple worship. That, you know, the woman at, at Samaria, you know, says, you know, they, they worship in the hills and the Jews worship in Jerusalem. But Jesus said, there come a time when men shall worship in spirit and in truth. And when we're talking about all this temple stuff, this is the temple I'm waiting for. Yeah. Well, the millennial temple is going to be something else as well. You know? Yeah. It's, um, mm -hmm. it's it'll, it'll, it'll be. Which temple are you on? The truth temple. Yeah, no, that's that's the um, Jesus is the, the temple. Temple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after millennium, so eighth day. Oh, yeah. So okay. that's after. Yeah, yeah. but that, that's the one that I'm I. I think you'll like the millennium. The millennium. Well, the, yeah, the millennium. Auto, you know. The millennium. <laughs> you'll have your new bodies. It's it's at the millennium is essentially the closest thing that we will see to the Garden of Paradise and back down in. Um, it was called the, the, the Garden of Paradise, the Garden of God, mm -hmm. uh, but it is really the closest thing we'll see to the Garden of Eden. The eighth day, so that after that, that will essentially be Garden of Eden again. So we don't be there for seven years. Uh, we were created to live on Earth, and that's where we'll be. So from the millennium onwards, that's where we'll be. There's only a short stop in heaven. You know, people talk about heaven all the time. You know, they've got a lot to say about heaven. But, um, uh, you know, what's there and the mansions and the da 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 da. And, but, you know, we're only there for seven years and some won't get there at all. Some will get there through the tribulation, so they'll have a few left years there. And there's some won't even see it. Some will come into the millennium um, through the tribulation. They won't even see heaven. And so, uh, you yeah, the focus is on the earth, not on. But the, the, um, um, in saying that, the earth is where Jesus will be. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not about being in heaven. It's about being where Jesus is. And this is what this passage it's is It's kind of good because, you know, nature's amazing. What's that? Nature, like the oceans and the mountains. Yeah. Well, there won't be any, there there won't be any oceans. oceans. In, the, in the Midland Kingdom, there will be. In the Midland so yeah, but not in the eighth. There's, no, there's no, uh, yeah, there's no ocean there's there's in there. No so in, in, in the millennium, the there's no I can only think of the seventh. I'm not even oh. thinking of the eighth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I found it weird how it's, it's this way off. Yeah, yeah. It's not even soon. 